Wonderful. Well, welcome everybody to this presentation on the explosive and aggressive behavior in, in high school. Um, Emmanuel asked me to present uh, to you today and making it specific to high school because of course, um, although aggression and frustration are emotions that happen to all of us, regardless of the age, the way that we might address it might um, differ a little bit from, from you know, a younger population to an older population. Um, and so I'm really excited today to be presenting on this topic for, for adolescents. I have to admit that my center of excellence tends to do, upon request, a lot of elementary presentations. And so it's nice to be able to, to do a bit of a shift and to do high school. Uh, and so... Um, talking about, you know, different behaviors that we see, uh, types of aggressive behaviors, whether it is um, attack, whether it is verbal, whether it is physical, and so forth. And so oftentimes, what we see is the tip of the iceberg, is everything that is observable in terms of behavior. What I want to work on today with you is not to focus necessarily on the symptoms of, of aggression, um, but really looking at beneath the um, iceberg. The developmental approach is very much of that, trying to make sense of certain phenomenons, and that if we have a better understanding of where it comes from, it really gives us better keys in order to address it more efficiently and in a developmentally friendly way where there isn't harm that is happening to the student, and uh, in terms of having a long-lasting change. Um, for those who have taken the material from the Neufeld Institute, who may have taken a course or a presentation, um, some of this will be um, a, a reminder of what you've heard before. Uh, but know that this material is not just from the Neufeld Institute. I've pulled in different bits and pieces. Um, and so, of course, um, what we're talking about here, when we're looking at the root of aggression, all of these symptoms, it is frustration that is at the root frustration in the term in the sense that something is not working for the student and it is upsetting them because they're not able to get what it is that they want or that they need um and frustration is a very primitive emotion similarly to alarm when we get a uh, you know it's when we have a sense of danger and we feel alarmed and we want to move to caution for survival purposes frustration comes from the same place in terms of very primitive um, type of reaction, and it really comes from the more primitive parts of the brain as well. Um, and so we can see when the, the limbic system is activated, oftentimes we've got the flight, fight, freeze response. And so we're talking about the fight response today. And a lot of that in terms of, of the in terms of the sympathetic nervous system that plays into it, you've got the adrenaline that happens, the cortisol, the heart rate that goes up, and so forth. And, and so the whole body is activated when we are frustrated. Um, and so examples of frustration in, in the day to day of our students, things like the fact that um, it's time to get up in the morning. And, and we know for teenagers waking up in the morning, their biological clock is different. They're, it's difficult for them to wake up early. Um, the fact that uh, sometimes they don't get organized fast enough. They're going to be late to take their bus um, in terms of chores, homework in terms of interactions with siblings, in terms of situations that come up where a no is presented, in terms of trying to, uh, you know, being good at everything, winning, not making mistakes and so forth, and, and how frustrating those events can be, not being able to get your way all the time, not being the best at everything and so forth. These are just some examples. But the reason why I'm highlighting this is because I want you to start thinking about what are those, those different frustrating circumstances that our students go through from the moment they wake up in the morning to the moment they go to bed at night and then the loop starts again the next day. I really want to make a distinction between anger and frustration because they're not the same and I th and and sometimes those words are used interchangeably in the literature and I think it is important to be able to distinguish the two. And so anger is actually something that is experienced only by by the human species in comparison to frustration who uh, for whom for whom it is experienced by all creatures of emotion um, and so we see animals that get frustrated i have a dog and so i could see sometimes my dog getting frustrated with a situation and so frustration comes from from the limbic system it's a more primitive emotion whereas anger it is something that is more conscious um it, it is evoked by the perception of injustice Whereas frustration is evoked by something not working for us. 
uh, anger involves ce the cerebral uh, cortex. So it's a more of, of a um, sophisticated type of emotion and is more in the consciousness. Whereas, as I was mentioning, frustration is a rude emotion that, that you can experience in your body and not even know that it's there. And so it can be very unconscious. And in terms of anger, it triggers impulses to seek justice, where we are there to get even, where we're there to um, to exact a revenge, to seek for an apology or so forth, whereas frustration will trigger the impulse to attack. And so today, we're not going to be focusing on anger, we're going to be fo focusing on frustration, because oftentimes the explosive behaviors that we see stem from that root of frustration. The other thing that I should mention as well is that not, not all aggression is considered violence. We can be frustrated and, and be aggressive, and the, the result of that aggression can be violating, but it doesn't mean that all aggression is violence. Because in order for it to be violence, it actually needs to be conscious, deliberate, intentional, done on purpose. Whereas aggression is in an impulse, and oftentimes it is quite, um, uh, how can I say, without filter. It's not something that is always conscious. It it pushes us and moves us to attack. The other thing that is really important to understand is that there is a continuum in frustration and aggression problems. That on the one hand, we could have attacking impulses that exist in us where we are frustrated with somebody and we want to act aggressively. So for example, um, you know, we're really frustrated with a situation in the moment and we want to, we want to hit the person because we're so frustrated but we're able to find our mixed feelings and find our patience. And so that patience will help to temper those impulses, but those impulses still exist. And so at, at the beginning of that continuum, we have the frustration in us where we will have these thoughts, these impulsive thoughts to act certain ways, but it doesn't mean that we act on them. Um, whereas at the if we continue on the continuum, then we we could have the eruption of that attack. And so the impulses get away on us. And, and then at that point, we are acting on our impulses. And this is at any age. It's not a question of being young or immature. And, and of course, more immature we are, the more we act on our impulses. Um, the same thing goes for if we are tired, if we are hungry, if there, if we are overwhelmed, if there's too much frustration happening in our system, then oftentimes it is difficult to be able to control and to temper that frustration, and it will come out into attack. And if we continue on that continuum even further, this is where we, we will get into what we call aggression problems. And so this is what I would like for us to focus on today in terms of the more the more explosive, aggress aggressive types of problems that do become violating. And so you can have an, an energy of attack um, and, and that attack could be done inwards. It could be done uh, verbally. It could be done through sarcasm or, or being or, um, you know, there's many different ways that we can attack and it's done in a more kind of contained, subtle way. But as we move out towards the, the continuum, this is where, especially if the person is not feeling their vulnerability, very defended, has, a, has an armor up, oftentimes those, those impulses are less tempered and they're much more violating in their, in their nature. Um, and so for students for whom this happens all the time, we, we, it, the, we're not equivalent it as the person being problematic. It is their attacking impulses that are a problem in itself. And so how can we adults come alongside that? But before we move into the what, the 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 what and the how, I really kind of want to look at a little bit a better understanding of how the attach the attacking energy works in our system. So Gordon Neufeld has used the analogy of the traffic circle to help give us a visual of how the aggression um, cycles in our body. And so the moment that something doesn't work for us and that we feel frustrated because it, we're not getting our way or that we're attempting to make something better or whatever it is, and it's just not, we're just not able to affect that change. 
And so oftentimes, if we're not too frustrated, the first step that we're going to do is to try to fix it, to try to, to, to find a different way in order to affect that change. So I'll give a concrete example just to kind of illustrate what I mean. And so let's say, you know, the student doesn't have a pencil and they, they need to do their work. And so the first thing they might do is they might scramble through their bag or they might try to ask somebody if they can get a pencil. And so this is when we are trying to effect change. But if for whatever reason, we are not able to get the material that we need. So we're not able to effect change. There isn't a pencil in the bag. Nobody is willing to give us the, the pencil. And so at this point, we are facing what we call futility. Um, another example, just to illustrate it differently, is that let's say the student has a very difficult task to do, and they're trying to avoid doing that task because it's just too frustrating for them. Um, but then the adults are coming around and saying to the student that it is necessary for them to do the task and that they're not going to get away with avoiding it. They need to confront it. And so being faced with the no or that limit or that boundary then will evoke even more frustration. Because if we were able to effect change, then the, the initial frustration would just dissipate. But if we are not able to effect change and that there is a barrier there, then this will add on additional frustration. Now, if we have a very vulnerable and, and, and a student who is close to their emotions and that they're very healthy and allow themselves to be vulnerable, and they're not placed in a situation that is too embarrassing, they may find the vulnerability in the disappointment in the fact that they are not able to affect that change. And, and sometimes with that disappointment will come sadness. But of course, it is a very vulnerable thing to, uh, to adapt to a situation that is not working for us. And we don't always move to adaptation easily. Many of our students, especially those that have an armor that easily comes up, don't feel safe and comfortable to feel the vulnerability of disappointment and sadness. And so they won't allow themselves to feel those vulnerable emotions. And so what will happen is that rather than having that second outlet to be able to resolve the futility and feel the disappointment and accept the fact that you can't change it, and that will give you relief and release. And so if you avoid that outlet, then what will happen is you will continue cycling in the traffic circle. And then the next step will be to have, if, especially if you're frustrated over the top, and that, and that nothing is working for you. And so you have an accumulated of different frustrations. And remember, I had given examples earlier about daily frustrations that our student have. So take this, if you were thinking about the analogy of the glass, there, for some students, their glass are already full the second they step foot in a school. And so they've already had so many situations in their day that have frustrated them. And they've been able to tolerate, to tolerate, to take it in. To, to not attack and so forth. But by the time they come to school, uh, whoops, by the time that they come to, to school and that they are at the end of their rope and now they have yet another situation that is frustrating them, then they're at the point where things are now starting to simmer and to overflow. And so sometimes what will happen is that the student will, if they're not able to temper themselves and be patient, if they're not able to have ambivalence and to have perspective and to have mixed feelings, then the impulse to attack will come out on its own. Now, I gave examples of daily frustrations for, for some of our students, but the thing that we need to know is that some students have much more daily frustration than others. And if we think about in their daily lives, Things like having their family, that, that their parents that are divorced, where there's a lot of conflict, high, high conflict, or that they've been kicked out, excuse me, I'll just go back a slide. They've been kicked out of their home because they fought with their parent and that their parent kicked them out, or that they're placed in foster care, or that they've been removed from their family because of DYP being involved, or because there is a hospitalization that has happened, that there, there, there are caregivers, there, there are loved ones are not often at home because they're busy with work or they're traveling or that there is somebody in the family that has been imprisoned or, or the other life's event. Thinking about all of the ACEs um, in terms of physical abuse, mental abuse, neglect, and so forth, all of these can add on frustration in the life of a student. 
Now, let's think about also in terms of et attachment, because attachment is our biggest preeminent need. But when it doesn't work for us, it is also our biggest threat. And so how often students will go on a day where they feel like they don't belong, where they feel rejected, where they feel that they're not understood, where they feel like they're not wanted, where they feel that they're alone, that they're betrayed, that they're neglected, that they're not important, that they feel different, they feel that they don't matter, and so forth. And so all of these examples are additional daily stressors that add on yet again another layer of frustration. And then I would invite you to start thinking above and beyond what's happening in their in their family lives and home lives. What are all of the other frustrations that they will live on a daily basis at school in terms of um, the setup of the classroom? Are they able to focus? Uh, do they get along with the teacher? Do they get along with the, the students with whom they're sitting next to? What about the learning situation? All of the frustrations that come from that, the fact that they don't understand what the, what it is that they're doing, or it's too difficult, or or that they just don't get it, or they've missed information because they've been out of class so often that they're, they're, they feel like they're completely um, left behind in terms of, of where they're at in the information, and all of that that is being piled up and piled up and piled up. The other thing that I should mention as well, for those that have heard me present um, I think it was last year or two years ago now on, on the adolescent development and all of the alarm and anxiety that comes with that. But that also brings frustration, not just anxiety. And so to go back to the attachment piece, um, th there's a thing at adolescence where they are trying to become their own person. So they're looking to individuate and to become their own. But at the same time, the fear and the threat on the one hand, being your own person, and on the other hand, needing to fit in, in order to feel safe and connected and accepted and to belong and so forth. And so that dichotomy and, and that ongoing challenge for adolescents between wanting to be your, whole, your own person and to holding on to yourself, but also not wanting to stand out too much, where then you can be ridiculed or that you can be rejected. And so all of that plays into it. So if we go back to the analogy of the iceberg, um, I'll just I'll just backtrack for a second, where if we are feeling our emotions and we are frustrated, we are able to name it and to say, oh, this thing's not working for me, or I'm trying to find a pencil, I can't find one, or, or I hate this work and I don't want to do it. So we're able to name it. But when we are at a place where there's so many different frustrations that accumulate in our system, the brain can only take so much. And so at that point, the brain will defend itself. It will protect itself from feeling the emotion of frustration because it is just too much to handle. But it doesn't mean that you don't feel your emotions, that the emotions disappear. Those emotions will continue to act out in the system. If we go back to the analogy of the, of the traffic circle, it will continue to cycle in the system. And so oftentimes, think about the student that you work with who will act out in, in, in a very impulsive and aggressive way. And then you try to talk to them and to ask them like, why did they do that? Or, or like, like what's happening and so forth. And they don't have an answer for you. And so oftentimes the reason why they don't have an answer for you is because they are defended in their vulnerability. And there's a disconnect between their brain in terms of the more sophisticated parts, the more conscious part, and in terms of the more primitive parts of the brain. So the behavior will come out because the, the emotion will push behavior to happen whether you are feeling your emotions or not. And the thing, though, is that in order to be able to temper and to filter your behavior, you need to feel your emotions to be able to be in connections with, with them, to be able to temper that impulse. Because if you don't feel the impulse, there's nothing to work with. And so to go back to the analogy of the iceberg and to move away from addressing the symptoms of the behavior, it's not about addressing the abruptness or the rudeness or the physical outbursts of the student. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't, we shouldn't establish safety in school. Yes, of course, we need to put parameters, we need to put limits, we need to establish safety. But in order to help a student who is stuck to find a way through, to have less of this, this attack impulse. It's not about trying to get them to build more skills. 
It is about helping them to feel those emotions. And only then, when they are in a safe context with us, the adult, and that they're feeling their emotions, can we have this exchange with them to, to, to reflect on, on their ex emotional experience, to give them tools in order to help temper those, those emotions and so forth. Please know that for a stuck child or adolescent, no tool works when you are defended. Because when you're not feeling the frustration come up, you don't even have the consciousness to say, let me go and get the tool that I need in order to help me with my situation. It's not conscious. And so they need us to co-regulate. They need us to remind them of where they're at in terms of their of their continuum of energy and, for, and to remind them of their tools. But the thing though about tools is that they can only really discover which tools work for them and practice until these tools are, are second nature when they're in a good headspace. So if the student is upset and frustrated, they're not receptive in that moment to be able to use those tools. And so we need to find pockets of time when they are at rest and receptive to be able to build that toolbox with them. So I just wanted to reiterate, just to illustrate to what degree emotions push us to action. And so the first thing that gets kicked off in our brain when we are frustrated is the, is the amygdala. The amygdala is the one that will send a signal to, to the hypothalamus that will say, you know, kind of like an alarm, alarm, the situation is not working for you right now and you're not able to affect change. And so the brain then, as it sends the signal from the amygdala to the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus will orchestrate what we call the paras the sympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system will send you into flight, fight, freeze response. And so that's why, for by the way, that not all students act in attack. Some, some students will do more of the flight response or will do more of the freeze response where they're in pursuit after the adults. And so it depends on the bent of the student. And so it explains why certain students will be more explosive and aggressive than others. It's not that they have more problems than the other student who was alarmed and, and anxious. It's just that they've taken a different bent in their emotion. And so, and then, and then the whole thing gets orchestrated in the body. When I was talking about the adrenaline and the, the, the cortisol and so forth, it pushes your body to act. And so this is not something that we, that we choose to do. Um, this is something that, that happens to us. We don't have a choice in that matter to be activated where we have a choice to some extent. And again, it depends on context. You have to be in a place where you're not too frustrated you have to be not too tired, not too hungry, that you're in a good context, that you're well connected with the adult who's co-regulating with you. And so in those moments, you can try to find ways to temper that impulse, but it doesn't mean that you are less frustrated. Um, and so in order to achieve healthy emotional maturity, we need to be able to express that frustration. And so a lot of the behavioral approaches will, will focus on stopping the emotion, containing the emotions, and, and not giving outlets in order to release it. Research has shown that when you do not allow emotions to release themselves and complete their loop, and that they become stuck over time, it can create big, big problems in terms of emotional, psychological, mental health problems. There's a, a book out there um, that was dedicated to adults, but I would apply it to children and adolescents as well called burnout. And in that book, they talk about the fact that when adults don't allow themselves to feel their emotions because they are so stuck in their ways and trying to intellectualize things or to contain things and shut things th down, that over time they burn themselves out. And so what I'm saying to you this morning is just as true to adults or, or to, to children, to any age. And so, it, and I'm not saying again that we should let students act out left, right, and center in the middle of the classroom when we're teaching a lesson. But can we find pockets of time in their day where they can have a space where they can go to and, a, and, and that they're able to let out some of that frustration and not just by talking. Many students don't like talking about their emotions. It actually frustrates them even more. 
they don't like to be uh, sitting face to face with an adult who is staring at them and asking them, drilling them about so many questions that they don't have the answers to. And it doesn't help to evacuate those emotions. For many students, they need to have nonverbal outlets in order to let that out. And proof has been shown through neuroscience. There's a lot more research now that is showing um, that the more that we can let out it through the doing, through and through sense of safety, that, that this will help for the emotion to express itself. So I, I mentioned before that if we are able to have patience and to temper that impulse, that then we're not going to attack. But it's not because you haven't attacked that you are no longer frustrated. The frustration will continue to loop in the cycle until it finds an outlet. Whether you are able to minimize the frustration, the input of that frustration, or that you're able to affect change and to find a solution, or that you're able to accept the fact that you're not gonna change it and to adapt, or that you let it out in attack. And so the thing about patience is that patience can only go for so long. And think about yourself as an adult, how often in, in, in our days, in our weeks, that we're able to be patient and to swallow situations and to tolerate and to take it in. And then at one point, the, the, the band stretches and stretches and stretches. And at what point, what happens? Boom. And, and so it's the same thing with our adolescence, where patience can be a short-term solution for the moment, but it is not a long-term answer. And so... To go back to being able to temper, I, I just wanted to explain to you that being patient is not being not frustrated. It is being frustrated, and yet we are still not um, allowing for the impulses to, to release themselves because we care about the person. Let's say, for example, you know, you have the impulse to want to hit somebody. And so you per you stop yourself from hitting because you like that person, and even though you're you're pissed off with them, you don't want to hurt them. And so the care for that person is helping you kind of soften the impulse to attack. So you might still say something to that person in words, but it doesn't mean that you're going to hit. And so the incline to attack is tempered by the incline to attach. The, the, the impulses that are driving us are tempered by the concern of the consequences. The violent urges are tempered by the nonviolent intentions. The impulse to hurt is tempered by the not wanting to harm. And so it's the two that need to happen together in order to help temper. And so how can we help when we're working with, with students rather than trying to get them to cut this out, focusing on trying to add this in, trying to find their vulnerability, find their care, find their nonviolent intentions, their concern for consequence, their incline to attach, their alarm to making a mistake. And so the more that we can get that second piece out, and, and not in the moment, by the way, because in the moment, they're not receptive. And so this would be done in a debrief, you know, after the fact, being able to revisit the situation and, and talk to talking to them about it, that we would go and tell them that we, even though today was a bad day and that they acted out in aggression, that you believe that they can do it and that they do have good days and that they are able to be patient, being able to help them see between the need to, the, to attack versus the need to attach. And the same thing in terms of being civil. Being civil is, is the, 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 the marriage of the impulse to attack with the alarm of being, being non-civilized. And so in order to, to remain um, connected with, with your, you know, people in your environment, with your village of attachment, we will, we will temper that attack in order to remain civil. And so those are the fruits that need to be developed. And so it's not about shutting down the, the, the impulse to attack. The other thing to look at to look at it this way is, is understanding that in order to help for emotions to develop and to become fully functional and, and civil and mature, it's not about starting with reflecting on our behavior. That is the last step that you will be doing with, with the student you're working with. Unless you have a student who's very mature and that naturally has that capacity to reflect and you're just there to accompany them in their reflection, 
if you're working with a student who's very immature and that they don't have the capacity to reflect and, and, and are very impulsive and have a hard time filtering that impulse, then, then starting by reflection is going at it by the back end. And so for those students, we need to start from the beginning. And so looking at, as I was mentioning, finding different pockets of time and, and, and spaces in the building where students can let out their frustration. And I'll give examples later in the presentation. I'm still focusing right now on the theory part, but we will walk through the more concrete. And so as we, we give space and time for expression and that we help them build the emotional literacy, helping them understand why is it that they're attacking? It's because they're frustrated. And what are things that perhaps that are frustrating them, even if we don't know for, for sure, I mean, we, we can we can guess how many different things that are happening in their day that is frustrating them. And if they can feel safe enough with us that they're able to be vulnerable and feel their emotions, only once we have these three things can now we have what we need as a foundation in order to move forward to temper those emotions and to reflect on those. And so, and so this is the first step in. And as you're building it with them, then we can get to that place. And so a lot of the more conventional approaches, when we're focusing on consequences and using behavior management systems, where we're using it to control the behavior, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be consequences in life. Of course, there are natural consequences in things. And, and, it, it, and it's okay for our understanding purposes to track, um, to, to see patterns in terms of the behavior. But there's a difference between patterning versus trying to use management systems to try to control the behavior of the student. Um, in terms of detentions and, and, and suspensions and so forth, I'm not saying there shouldn't be some. Sometimes we don't have a choice. Sometimes because of, of, of an aggressive, explosive situation that puts students at risk for their safety, we don't have a choice to suspend. But we need to keep in mind that the suspension is not what's gonna teach the lesson to that student. Oftentimes when students are suspended, they're just home frustrated because they don't feel understood. They they and it's just yet another proof that they that either adults can't handle them or that things are not working for them. And so the true purpose of suspensions is for the adults to have the time to mobilize themselves to come up with a plan for when the student comes back. And so all of these different measures, I'm not saying that we shouldn't that we should eliminate them. What I'm saying is, is let's nuance them and understand their impact because if we're trying to use consequences to teach a lesson, then what will happen is that it will become a vicious circle because given their immaturity or their defendedness and all of the intensive explosive emotions that they're having that leads to alienating behavior, and that in turn will make the, the adults will take it personal, will we'll be upset by that, and will use this very harsh disciplining, will just create a vicious circle. Well, it will make the student more frustrated, more defended, more shut down, and then we have no way in. And so if we were to look at it from this angle of the pyramid, it's the emotional problems where there isn't expression that can lead to defendedness. And if we lead to defendedness, then we don't have the 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 feeling in order to not just to temper the, the, the attack in the moment, but you also need to feel your emotions to grow up from them. Um, and so it's an issue in the short term, but it's also an issue on the long term where you will remain stuck developmentally. And this will be a vicious circle. Where it will remain in terms of learning and behavior problems. And so trying to look at it where we're going to, rather than, than focusing at the top, we're going to start from the root. And so looking at the relationship, trying to set up times where the student can 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 be connected to us, can feel safe with us, will we'll practice different things, will feel understood and accompanied and so forth. And that will develop a sense of safety. And in turn, it will reduce the defenses enough where the student will feel their emotions. And this will allow for healthy development to take place. And this in turn over time will become the learning and behavior resolution. Now, oftentimes I get the comment at the high school level, shouldn't they be 
aren't they old enough or shouldn't they be mature enough now that they are in high school in order to be patient and to be civilized? And, and why, why is it that we should be treating them like babies? Because they are in high school and, and, you know, if you do that in elementary, that's fine. But in, in high school, it should be different. Please understand that, that maturation is not inevitable. We all grow older. We don't necessarily all grow up. We see adults in, in our society that have not grown up, that act like four-year-olds. And so it's not a question of age. It is a question of development and maturation. And so when you're working with students that are stuck and that are acting like preschoolers, chances are their maturity level is no further along than a preschooler. And so I'm not saying that we should baby them. But I'm saying that we should understand the fact that they can't better in that moment and that they need us to be able to compensate and to put together parameters to help them to be more successful. So the shift goes from rather than saying what's wrong with you, this behavior has to stop focusing on, oh, my goodness, is this student experiencing so much frustration, too much is not working in their life. And so how can I help reduce, release some of that frustration in my everyday? What can I do with that student, whether it's to just listen to them vent or, or to, to give them time and space to be able to to express themselves in different ways uh, and so forth. And so we'll get we'll get there in the examples in a minute. But before we get there, uh, and, and this was part of my presentation in the developmental approach, Understanding that behavior doesn't change because you've taught a competency or a skill. Behavior will only change when emotion has taken course. So when the brain has matured enough, will then um, the behavior change because it is because the, the person is more mature. Only when they are feeling their emotions and that they're connected body and mind, that they will able to shift their behavior. Only when they are vulnerable and, and, and feeling those emotions and feeling safe, can they practice different tools in order to gain um, capacity to manage those emotions and change their behavior. And again, only when they are in safe, grounded attachment with a, with a present person who is co-regulating with them at first and doing this progressively, can they have the rest in order to unfold sequentially and then eventually for the behavior to unfold. So your role as, as an adult working with students that, that, that are experiencing a lot of aggression and attack and explosive behavior are actually multifold. I think on the first hand, are there things that we can help them limit in terms of the intake of frustration? I'm thinking, for example, you know, very sensitive students that during lunch, or during the break that they're outside with, with peers and that they get teased or that they get bullied or that they get pushed around, that they get themselves into fights and that there's so many different situations that trigger them during break and, and during lunch. Could it be possible that we have the student, and I'm not saying all the time, but could we have pockets of time where the student can have a place to go and something to do where it's structured and protected, where they are not exposed to more wounding from their peers? We know that peer, peer interaction is probably one of the most wounding situations because a peer is not mature enough to be sensitive and, and, and considerate and civilized enough to care about the other person's feelings. And so oftentimes, um, you know, and, and especially now with social media, I mean, that's a whole other story I, that I haven't even opened. Um, I've, I've got a 14 year old at home. And she'll tell me, you know, through some of these applications, these social media applications, the, the, the degree of wounding that happens from the commenting, from the icons where you can give a, a, a reaction to, to a post and so forth, uh, feeling ignored, feeling like you don't fit in. I mean, that's a whole other layer um, in terms of frustration for our teens. Um, and so trying to minimize some of that frustration. Um, the, the other thing is, can we, if we can, help effect change, but if we cannot effect change because it is not possible to, I mean, not everything you can fix, not everything we can change, and nor should we. It is important for, for, for children and adolescents to grow up knowing that not everything's in their control, that there are life utilities, 
that they that they need to just accept because it's part of life. And so part of our job is to help soften the blow in terms of if we are putting a boundary or a limit, that we're also doing it being empathetic in the way that we're doing it. So on the one hand, we're putting that limit, but on the other hand, we're also there to support them in the frustration. The, the, if they were to have a rebuttal, if they were to have, um, you know, a, a, a fur, further upset and trying to, you know, convince you or so forth, that we're understanding of that because it's part of the process. Here, on the other hand, before they get to that place where they're going to attack in a way that is very explosive, can we find? So I added an I added an outlet here, an exit. Can we find moments preventatively in the play mode? So thinking about creative a creative expression, whether it's through photography, through um, through mural making, um, through knitting, so many different ways through through writing music, playing music. Um, journaling, there's so many different ways that we can go about in the play mode, letting out the extra frustration. And this can be a way to release it. Um, and, and if and so that would be another way, another place where you could affect change. And of course, if the student is going to attack, then how can we accompany them through it? And how can we then also debrief afterwards? So now I want to get into the more concrete um, practices. Um, the Center of Excellence for Behavior Management has created a pyramid of intervention for high school. And in that pyramid of intervention, we look at the, the best universal practices for all, where we do this on a daily, regular basis, preventatively. Um, and so this is the ongoing kind of support measures that are in place for everybody. And then we're going to look at some of the more targeted practices for some students for whom the universal measures are not enough. And then we're going to be looking at the tier three individualized and intensive um, um, measures for those students, the few students, this should, should really just be one to 7% in a school, that for whom a targeted and universal practice is not sufficient. And so we're going to focus from tier one being preventative, looking at, at building a sense of safety in the environment for the student, to tier two, putting things where we're collaborating with the student, we are compensating for their immaturity, supporting them, acting as a co-regulator. This is what we're doing that is more targeted. And um, having communication that is open between colleagues, from the teacher to the support staff, to the, the remedial teacher, to administration, to the consultant that comes in from the board and so forth. And so all the key players being in the know of what are the triggers for that student and what are the practices that, that are successful. And so to be in the know of that. And then we're gonna look at in terms of tier three, the more intensified and individualized measures, what can we do in the crisis intervention, de-escalation, in terms of, of, of planning, developing the plan, inviting for emotional release, um, and, and helping diffuse the situation. So that's what we're going to cover in this section. So in terms of tier one, uh, the, uh, and by the way, tier two and three cannot be successful to the, to the same degree if tier one is not put in place. And many, many times I, I, rec I see it when I come and visit schools that there's a lot, a lot of energy put into very tier three intensified individualized plans. And then there isn't much in terms of the universal. They build on each other. It's not one or the other, it's one and the other. And so for things to take place in the classroom, and especially at the high school, I feel like, like things have shifted so much at the elementary in terms of the setup of the space, in terms of flexible seating, in terms of brain breaks, in terms of having a designated area where students can go and so forth. I really don't see it that much at the high school level. And so to start thinking this way, and I do understand that, that the setup is different in high school. There's many more teachers, many more transitions and so forth. But could there be at least a minimum of certain of these measures in tier one? And so thinking about the teacher, the teacher student relationship. So it's not just about about saying good morning, students, take out your book at, at page four. It's really about having the morning greeting, having a morning ritual. And, and, and this can happen in high school because I've seen it happen before. 
where, where the adult will take the time to get to know the students, get to know their name. I remember my daughter last year, one of the teachers she hated the most was a teacher for whom never took the time to get to know the names of her students. And so that for my, for my daughter was a no-go because for her to feel that the teacher didn't even want to bother to know the name of the student, she didn't want to bother to even get to know the teacher and to please the teacher because she could see that the teacher didn't care. And I'm not saying the teacher didn't really care, but that's the way that it came across. And so the importance of building that relationship and taking the time and showing genuinely that yes, we're here to learn, but we're not just here to learn. We're 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 a, 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 an extension of the, of their family. We have a sense of belonging that needs to be developed in the classroom. Um, and coming alongside the student, um, even if the behavior seems irrational, you know, the brain has its reasons, whether it's for survival purposes or that they're trying to find ways to adapt. Um, you'll see when I'll be presenting uh, tomorrow on neurodiversity, um, the, all of the differences in the body in order to help to adapt and all of the differences that we see. And so to be able to make space for that diversity, to be more inclusive and so forth. Um, in terms of things being more predictable, um, in terms of scheduling, um, in terms of having a variety of intervention options that we can give students, um, you know, sometimes we stick to the same ones and, and, and not all strategies work for all students. You know, for example, even flexible seating. Um, I've seen classrooms where they've invested just on yoga balls or they've invested just on, on uh, wobble stools. Not, not all students do well with wobble stools. Wobble schools, stools can actually be a distraction to certain students. And so you want to have a variety of different things to be able to adapt it to the need of that student. Um, the same thing with, um, what was I saying? I was talking about the flexible seating. And oh, um, in terms of, of if you were to be doing brain breaks. Now, by the way, Edutopia wrote an article at the beginning of the year on, on 17 brain breaks tailored for high school. And there's so much research out there demonstrating the powers and benefits of giving students brain breaks. Um, and so in order to be more inclusive and to adapt to the needs of different students, it's not just about doing high level um, energy activities where we're venting and we're letting it out. For, again, for some students, it is actually more um, uh, dysregulating for them to do high level energy activities. For some of them, they need to do something that is more low level, something that is more around fine motor, for example. You've got you've got a puzzle there um, that could be, you know, a, a good example of fine motor. Um, again, trying to think about creative outlets in terms of painting, drawing, poetry, uh, movement, music, and so forth. You know, being able to have and and I'm not saying this should be happening during class time. Uh, setting up pockets during breaks and during lunch after school um, where their interest clubs, getting students involved in student life, building that sense of belonging to the school and so forth. And so these are many, many examples at tier one. In terms of tier two, so now we're, we're, we're it's, it's not just teachers, support staff get involved at tier two. Um, where it could be a combination of having supports in the classroom, but also supports in the either in the hallway or in, in other sections of the building. And so having a quiet corner in the classroom um, where the student can go and just take a break to be able to reset. They could have headsets to be able to cancel out the noise if they need to work individually. Um, I've seen high schools that have done this in the, in the hallway where they, they found a nook, a corner, you know, somewhere in the building where students could go and it's not a punishment, it's a reset space. And this is a, is beneficial, not just to the student, but, uh, but the other students in the classroom and the teacher as well, in order to give a respite to everybody. Um, in terms of setting up for some students that need to have that extra support to, to regulate and to recenter themselves, especially those that have learning difficulties and, and that and that the learning experience can be very overwhelming and frustrating. Can we prepare a bin for that student that they can use in class in the designated area or that they could be using, um, they could be bringing it with them to another space and working with a tech or another adult. And in that bin, you could have things like, for example, a fidget, you could have a journal, you could have a book. They could be doing an activity like, for example, um, a, a um, forget what those are called, the called, I mean, you see the picture. Origami. 
thank you origami <laughs> Um, and so, um, yeah, and, and different types of activities to help to recenter. You could be putting in the bin as well, um, different academic activities that the, if the student has an IEP and that they have IEP goals, we could be putting in the bin um, if pieces of work that they could be doing easily on their own without too much uh, supervision from the adult and then working towards their IEP goals. Um, it could be that we've got a space in the building um, and, and I could understand in high school, maybe we wouldn't have something like this unless we've got it in, in an isolated room somewhere. Um, but it could be that the student has um, time that, it, that during break or during um, lunch where they could go and, and have a, you know, a, a workout um, and to be able to let out some of those toxins going outside, taking a walk. There's so many different ways that we can do this uh, in, in, in a targeted way. Now, if we move over to more individualized, oftentimes by the by the point that we get to individualized, the support staff are more involved, much more involved at that point. Oftentimes, these are students that have a hard time staying in class all day, every day. These are students that need to have an, an, an a, a, a adapted schedule where they've got pockets of time in class. Yes, of course, they need your, you know, we're in a school setting, so they need to learn but at the same time, not keeping them in, in class at all costs, where they could go somewhere else, more quiet, more one-to-one, -one, where they could focus on individual work. It's so, so, so vital at tier three that there is a sharing of, of the, the responsibility of those students um, in terms of um, you know, not being with the same adult all day, every day, that they have pockets of time where they're going in different spaces. Um, communication is so important um, between staff members, collaboration as well. And so to be able to set up, um, you know, all of that. Part of it in terms of the teamwork would be that above and beyond the teacher greeting, that there would be a, a, a significant a, um, assigned adult that would have a daily check-in with the student. And during that check-in, you could be talking about their day, could be talking about what happened the night before, could be checking to see if they've got their materials, are they ready to go to class, where their headspace is at. Um, it is meant to be a moment also of genuine connection where you're showing to the student that you're not just boom, 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 doing this because you've got your agenda and that you just want to get it over with. It has to be a time where you're showing that you're genuinely invested in the student and taking the time to connect with them. Because when you connect with them in good times, then there's a better chance that you're going to have a better, an easier influence in not so good times. Um, and so research has shown that time and time again. Can we find ways to, um, to um, what's the word, honor, honor the integrity of the student? That if they are having a hard time in the class and that they're getting disorganized and that they're acting out, that we find a subtle way to get them to go somewhere else, not in a way that we're kicking them out, not in a way that we're telling them that they need to go reflect, but in a way that we send them out for respite. It's all in the way that we do it. So they're still leaving the class, but we're doing it in a way that is respectful and, and honoring where they're at. And so one place where the student could go is the nurturing support center. Um, we, we, at uh, Eastern Townships, you do have a few schools that are that have a nurturing support center. So it's not just elementary that have one. These pictures here of, are, are of a nurturing support center at Western Quebec. I actually have a video on the CBM website that describes the um, nurturing support center for the high school um, and, and what's the purpose and so forth. And so it is similar to the elementary, but, it, but also different in many ways. In terms of emotions, and being able to accompany students with their emotions. But again, going back to the stairs, we, we let them to express, we can name, but then getting to that place of reflection and so forth can only be done after we've, we, we've set the foundation. On the CBM website, we've got something called the Squawk Box, which has been made specifically for high school. And you've got everything available to download. And we've got two video capsules that explain how to use it and how to build the tool. So you've got a box with a legend, and then you've got different cards, different colored cards for different sections. And then you've got a laminated folder sheet that goes along with the bin. And inside the bin, you could have fidgets, there would be dry erase markers, 
Um, and so I invite you to go and take a look at that, um, at the squawk box. If you don't have time to build the squawk box, another easy sheet that could be used is the emotional um, feeling wheel. Um, and so you've got different emotions that are placed in categories. Um, and so those can be used as well, just to kind of, in terms of curiosity, I'm not saying that it's about saying to the student that they should cut it out or that this, the green section is the more acceptable section. All emotions have their reason, their purpose. And so it's not about trying to cut out the emotion. It's about just being curious and, and helping them recognize what's happening in their body, fostering a relationship with their frustration that we name it to them. I see you're frustrated. I see it's not working for you. That's not what you had in mind. It didn't turn out the way you wanted it to, to turn out, to be able to normalize it meet and, and saying to the student, me too, I get frustrated in life. Me too. Sometimes, you know, things happen and, and you know, I, I really would have wanted it to go this way and it didn't. And, and oh my goodness, was I frustrated because how often students feel ashamed of the fact that that they have impulses to attack because they've been told time and time again that they shouldn't but we need to tease apart the frustration from the impulse to attack to be able to normalize the fact that we all get frustrated and there's actually a a, a benefit to being frustrated if we were never frustrated we would never have the perseverance and the determination to, to, to continue on in a situation that is not working for us. And so frustration is actually a beautiful thing. It is a very necessary thing because if we were never frustrated, then we would give up and then we would never um, evolve and grow and unfold and so forth. So the issue is not frustration in itself. The issue is the fact that there is defendedness around frustration and that it leads to attack. And so how can we help soften some of these defenses? Um, and so again, facilitating safe eruptions for the student to vent. Um, and, and so trying to find what's that natural bent for the student. And so if the student is the type to use their fists, then could we, for example, um, have a dartboard um, with Velcro balls and they could be throwing the Velcro balls onto the dartboard. I saw at Costco a year ago and I don't, it probably doesn't exist anymore, but it was this really cool thing where there was a, a target and there was these plastic and foam um, kind of like these, um, uh, how do you call this to uh, not a hammer, but, uh, but um, you know, you know, like, like when you, I don't know if you guys ever seen this in a show or a movie and you're able to go and throw it against the wall and, and then it just, um, it just stays stuck. And so anyway, it was Velcroed and it was the similar activity, but done with Velcro. It was really, really cool. So it could be something like that. Um, it could be uh, doing different uh, yoga positions, doing some stretching with them, some breathing exercises with them and so forth, um, but really following the bent of the student. If you see a student who is very frustrated and wanting to punch, breathing techniques are really not the way to go in that moment. And so it's about honoring where they're at and addressing it at that level in a safe way, of course, but addressing it at that level. And slowly but surely, we could get to, all, to other ways such as breathing, but sometimes we're completely disconnect, disconnected in the way that we address a student and they're here and we're trying to address it there. And so trying to, to come to a place where we're starting where they're at. Um, in terms of a plan, especially for our tier three students, it is important that there is something clear that is put down systematically on paper in terms of for that particular student, what are their triggers? Are there times in the day or times in the week with a certain teacher, a certain subject area? What are those different elements that we need to be aware of? What are those, those interventions that we should never do with that student because they're a trigger? What are those things that work and so forth? And what's our plan A? And if our plan A cannot happen, what's the plan B and plan C? And so, and this, so this is just an example of a, an action plan for the high school. Um, it's available on the website, but um, if you have your own, want to make your own, by all means, you can adapt it. But to me, what's important is not how it looks, but the fact that you've got something concrete on paper that all of the adults that are involved, especially given at the high school, that there's many teachers, there's a lot of, there's a lot of actors involved, a lot of different players. And so you want to make sure that they're all on the same page. If we are faced with a challenging situation, the number one goal should be to try to 
avoid making headway where we're going head to head with the student and to try to aim to not do harm. And so we can address the violation simply sticking to the facts, but being careful about not finding ourselves in a power struggle with the student. Think about your CPI training or your BMS training. Um, and, and so being careful to not get caught into that back and forth and argument with the student. Being careful about being alienated. I mean, we're human too. We too have a traffic circle. We too have our own emotions. We too get triggered. And so to be able to recognize that if we are indeed triggered in that moment, is there another adult that is not triggered that can get involved? Um, and, and to be able to support the, the different strategy that we're doing, to be able to, to detach our anger from our discipline. Rather than trying to control the student and their behavior, focusing on the circumstances, making sure that everybody's safe, um, trying to exit the situation sooner than later, because we know with research that when a student is up or, or any, any person is upset, the first thing that goes is the auditory processing. They are not hearing us. They are so caught up in their own inner world that it is, they're not receptive. It is not the time or place to be trying to teach the lesson. And so trying to choose a more suitable time in order to address it and to debrief. And of course, if there has been fallout between you and the student, then to be able to bridge and repair that. Because if we don't, and that they take it personal and that they become more um, defended vis-a-vis -vis us, that it is much harder the next time to intervene because we don't have that same relationship. And so how can we be detached to the best of our capacities? And again, we are human. We, we, are, we are designed to be emotional. So it's easier said, that, said than done to be rational and to be detached when the student is dysregulated and explosive, but to the best of our capacity, trying to focus on, focusing on rather than the behavior itself, what is the student trying to convey? How am I responding to that situation? Am I helping or am I hindering? What, what am I expressing or conveying? How are they responding to what I'm doing? So it's a dance, it's a back and forth. Um, and so we're using a lens where we're trying to make sense of the student and the context, but we're also using a mirror where we're keeping ourselves in check to make sure that we're in a, in a tempered place and that we're not triggered ourselves. And so looking at it from this angle, where having the three elements keeping, keeping in consideration, on the one hand, who's the student? Are they, are they, are they mature? How sensitive are they? Do they have a history of trauma or, neuro or neurodiversity? Um, what's their attachment uh, capacity with, with you? Are, are they attached to you? Are they receptive to you? In terms of the context, uh, what's the environment in that moment? Is it over the top in terms of stressors? What's the emotional state of the student? Sorry, I should have said teen here. Um, and, and so forth. Are they engaged in your dynamic? Or are they receptive to you? And yourself, where are you at in your stress level? Um, in terms of the, the are your are your interventions reflective or reactive? What about your your nonverbal and your verbal? What is it saying? And so keeping that in mind, keeping in mind that in the stress curve, if you and the student are both in a place where you are either fully frustrated in a panic, angry, or anxious, it's not the time or place to get into it. It's about taking a step back and giving space. And again, going back to your CPI training it does, or, or the BMS training, it says it very concretely there about, about giving space and taking a step back, being, being mindful of the proximity to the student. And so depending on where we at, we're at in the stress curve, if the student is just in a good place, then it's okay to be challenging with the student. If they're more fatigued, then at that point, we're more supportive with them. If they are, are going further into the stress curve, at that point, we're co-regulating with them if they need. But by this point, we are not doing anything else than to invite release and to de-escalate with them. And so some examples of de-escalation techniques could be that we remove the audience. Uh, because if the audience is there, that it is triggering to the student, being able for to honor and, and to to respect the integrity of that student and to giving them personal space. Being mindful of our verbal cues, our, our nonverbal cues, our paraverbal cues. So if we're talking too fast, we're talking too much, uh, our tone of voice, the volume of our voice, all of that can have an impact and can be quite triggering for a student, especially if they are dysregulated in the moment. 
demonstrating active listening and active listening, by the way, isn't, isn't about trying to wait to have your turn to respond to what the student is saying. It's truly taking the time to being silent and listening fully to what the student is trying to convey. And so, and so we're being silent and we're reflecting on, on what it is that they're saying, trying to the best of our ability to being empathetic, to being careful about judgment, sometimes in, in, in the way that even our eyes speak, we roll our eyes by mistake, or we're, be, we're being sarcastic, or, 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 or the comment that we've used it has a judgment in it. And so being so careful, especially when the student is dysregulated, it is not the time or place to, to trigger them further. Maybe the student needs a break, need, needs needs a reset. Trying to accommodate to accommodate that for them, trying to reassure them that things will be okay, um, allowing and providing space for them to let off steam, um, avoiding getting caught, like I said before, in that power struggle, um, and, and that and that when you see that the student is challenging you, and that they're using these very kind of um, disrespectful comments, trying to view it as the fact that they are frustrated and they just need to vent. It's not personal. It is not directed at you. It's just that you are there while this is happening. Trying to move away from trying to teach that lesson or to reason with the student, especially when the behavior is appearing to be erratic and irrational. Setting simple and concise limits by offering few options and alternatives in a respectful manner, allowing time for them to be able to digest it and, and for them to make that decision and to choose whatever it is that they um, are choosing, that we are careful that we are not insisting on certain things that might trigger further the situation. And again, not taking it personally, avoiding overreacting ourselves and using the lens in the mirror. Um, in terms of, of uh, other things to consider, um, immediate priorities are safety first. And so if the student is in a, in a fight, separating the students, trying to find a way to get the student somewhere else where they can be in private and that they can be safe. Focusing on, on, on listening and being reflective. Uh, so I've said this already. In terms of the body positioning and physical proximity, in terms of the nonverbal responses, um, I won't read them all. I'll let you read the slides. All of that is, 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 is um, an easy read. In terms of your posture and your, and your body movement, being careful that we don't do these sudden gestures or that we're walking too fast towards the student, especially for a student that has a history of trauma, these things can be quite provocative and, and, and threatening to them. Being careful about our body language, you know, just the way that we position our, our, our hands on our body can speak volumes, even if we are being empathetic and warm. And so keeping that in mind um, in terms of, of our mood, in terms of our intensity, in, in the way that we listen to the students and, and, and how we say things. So just giving a few examples, instead of being very abrupt and saying things like, be quiet, don't get upset, why are you so defiant? Don't be so bossy. That's enough already. And things like that, that we're careful with the language. I see you're, you're eager to share that, that whatever it is that they're trying to say. It's really important to you. I see you need to let it out. It's okay to feel mad or sad. Um, it sounds like you need to follow your instinct in this moment. Uh, I bet it feels better uh, for you to know that you're in control of that decision. It sounds like you need for me to give you space. And so you see the shift in the language. It's not at all the same way of, of, of where we're being more authoritative or authoritarian versus being more empathetic and coming alongside the student. And so we're, we're not giving it permission. We're not saying that we condone it, but we can be understanding of that frustration. And so some of the non-restrictive interventions could be um, uh, you know, with, with, if we move away from, from, and we'll get there in a second, in terms of restraints and isolation, um, and, and thinking first about removing any items that might be dangerous, removing the audience, removing other people, setting those limits, asking for a staff member to be present, how often, especially if the student is completely dysregulated and being, being very aggressive, you want to have a second adult to back you up, um, calling for help if nobody, uh, if nobody is present. Being aware in your school, what is the policy in terms of restraints and isolation? 
Now, I know for a fact that the Ministry of Education will be coming out soon with a document to, as a guideline to be able to support um, school boards across the province in terms of their guidelines. But each of the school boards right now, as it is, I know ETSB have their own guidelines that are that exist and that are out there. Are you aware of your board and school guidelines? Are you aware in terms of what are the parameters around restraints and isolation? Um, and so forth. And so and so I invite you to go back to your school teams and to have this conversation, find out what what are those limits? Have you have you gotten the training in terms of de-escalation techniques um, and so forth and how necessary that is in terms of debriefing? Because to me, debriefing is just as important as the crisis intervention situation. We need to follow up with the student and debrief with them. Once they've calmed, of course, where where we are there to focus on on the incident and what happened and to be able to help them name things and to recognize, you know, what happened for them. Can we can we also give them hope that even if today they had a bad day, that tomorrow is another day and that we believe in their, their potential, that they are able um, to their best ability to not always be an attack and so forth. Um, and, and other things to consider in terms of debriefing, some, stu some students need more time to detach themselves from the incident in order to revisit it. And so it can happen that sometimes we're too quick and that we debrief too soon. And so if you see that as you're trying to debrief that you've re-triggered re the student and that they are activated yet again, that it is too soon when we need to give it time and space and not for, and for some students, it could be hours. For other students, it needs to be days. Um, and it's, by the way, it's never too late to address a situation, even if it, it's been a week or two. You can go back and revisit a situation anytime. It is never too late um, and so forth. Um, in terms of documentation to consider, so I, again, I would invite you, as I mentioned before, find out if, if you, have you seen your guidelines at your board in terms of restraints and isolation? I know for a fact that at ATSB, there are forms that are available in that guideline. Have you seen the forms? There's one form for an incident report and there's one form for debriefing. Has that been utilized with your teams? In terms of, of um, anti-violence and anti-bullying protocols, what are your protocols at your school and, and the steps and, fo and follow up and so forth? In terms of trauma, in terms of crisis intervention, are there other documentation plans and protocols that exist? Does the student have a behavior action plan? If not, maybe they would they would benefit from having one. If they have one, maybe it's it's possible that at this point the student would need something more formalized in terms of an IEP. And part of that would be a safety plan. And what is plan A and plan B for that student um, and so forth. And so has that been happening with your school teams? Um, in terms of intervention, intervention planning, um, you know making sure that in the IEP, there is a section if needed, if, if relevant, dedicated to the, the frustration and aggression problem and what are the parameters and, and measures that, that we would put in place to help the student be, be um, more successful and safe. Um, in terms of the safety plan, are there specifics about the student's uh, escalation behavior? Are there, do we know about their potential triggers? Do we have the indicators um, that the escalation is moving towards imminent danger? Do we have non-physical interventions being used as first response? When facing an emergency situation where imminent danger is involved, um, what are the specific physical interventions if need be? So they're done by whom? They're done how? Um, to what limit? How are they being monitored? Um, uh, in terms of the, the discontinuing the physical intervention, when do we stop? Um, and all of that comes with the CPI and the BMS training. In terms of communication um, and so forth, the post-incident responses, are we following up? Or is, is there a debrief? Are we documenting this? Sorry, could you say that again? Oops, sorry, guys. It's my watch. So these are all things that as a school team needs to be talked through and asked. And so I invite you to go and take a look at the CBM website. I've got a section dedicated to frustration and aggression with, with editorials, with infographics, with webinars. Um, I've got many other things that are available. I know for a fact that Eastern Townships, uh, many of you have a copy of the book Reclaiming Our Students. If you don't, 
uh, please ask around. I'm sure colleagues have some. There is a chapter that is dedicated to the student who is aggressive. And there are more examples in that book of things that you can do to come alongside the student. So I'm going to stop sharing my slides right now. And I just want to bring you quickly, uh, wait, I'll stop sharing and I'll share again. I'm going to share um, my screen. I just want to show you uh, the website for a second so you know where to go. So if you go onto the CEBM website, I'll put it in the chat for those who don't know of the website. It is www.cebm.ca. I'll put for everyone. So here's the website. And um, onto the website, I've got underneath practices, a section that is dedicated to secondary. So here you will find the, the presentation that I talked to you about before on, on making sense of adolescence and, and its development. I, I did another one last year on teen anxiety and resilience. Recently this year, I did one on teen anxiety part two, uh, where we talk about neurodiversity and trauma. I will be adding today's recording to this page. The pyramid of intervention, if you wanna take a look at it, is right here. So I invite you to go and take a look. We've, there, there are seven pages to the uh, pyramid of intervention. I don't know if it's going to open. Uh, where we, we, I walk through examples of measures that can be applied at tier one, tier two, tier three, and considerations for each of the tiers. So I invite you to go and take a look at that. If you would like to uh, put together the squawk box, I've got it here on that page. Plus, I've got a few other um, kind of... Um, just kind of conversation starters, food for thought, um, different types of questions. Um, Eva in the past, Eva Degostini, who was the coordinator before me, did pres other presentations for high school. So they're available here. And you've got so many different editorials that are available underneath here. Um, in terms of the, um, the resource center, so if you go onto resource center, it will take you to a second website. And if you go to challenges to frustration and aggression, you will find here different materials and resources. Um, I, I have here, the, this was the webinar for elementary, so that's not relevant to you. The, the webinar, I'll be putting it uh, for high, high school or, on, or will be on the other page. But I've got um, different editorials and so forth that are available here. This, um, this um, placemat, oh, it doesn't work, the link. I'll have to go fix that. The, um, the placemat is uh, adapted to elementary. I need to work on a high school version. I just haven't yet, but it, it might be inspirational, even though it is geared towards elementary, there may be a lot of pieces in there that would be relevant for high school. So I invite you to go and take a look at that. I've got it both in English and in French, and it is, it, it is geared towards aggression and frustration. So I will stop sharing my screen. I will stop the recording.